Hello, everyone. I'm Dhanya Rajendran, and welcome to this uh, uh, discussion that we are going to have on what is the kind of knowledge that journalists should have when it comes to legal formalities, cases that could be filed against them, etc. I have with me a panel of uh, people to discuss this. Can we uh, have the panel on the screen, please? Hi. So I have with me Kunal Majundar, who is from uh, CPJ, Shahina, uh, a journalist from Kerala, Joanita Britta Menon, who works with the Trust Law, which is, Thom which is part of the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and Tanvir Vasi, a journalist from Madhya Pradesh. So uh, I'm, I'm going to directly jump into the conversation because each of you have a lot of things to say, especially in the environment, in the political environment that we work in. Let me go to Shahina first. For those of you who may not be aware, Shahina is one of the first journalists in this country who had a case uh, filed against her under the draconian UAPA. She's still fighting the case which was filed against her in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and Shahina, could you tell us briefly what happened then, where that case stands now, because you've approached the court for relief multiple times. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also someone who learned law. After yeah. your experience, you actually went and learned law uh, at being a practicing journalist because you realized that understanding law would help you further. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Danya. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, actually, my case started in 2010, uh, not in 2007, in 2010. Um, I went to Karnataka, uh, I mean, a place called Kudagu in Karnataka uh, to report uh, on a bomb blast case in which a Malayali Muslim scholar was accused and uh, the witnesses in those cases were actually fabricated. So I interviewed the witnesses and I, in, through my interview, uh, I exposed that that case was fabricated and the entire charge sheet was fabricated. So this was the reason for uh, Karnataka police to slap cases on me. There were two cases uh, on the same course of action. There were two cases in two police stations. And uh, I, I have been fighting that case since 2010. As Dhanya pointed out, I was booked under this Unlawful uh, Activities Prevention Act along with some sections of IPC like 5, 506 and, uh, you know, uh, 34, Section 34 and 120B, etc. So uh, I got bail after seven months. I got anticipatory bail after seven months of filing these FARs against me. I was actually like, I was running from here and there. I mean, like I was advised by everyone not to uh, fall into their hands until you get a bail. So it was like, a, you know, the life was very tough for me till I got bail. But after that, uh, the Karnataka police uh, took huge time for doing everything like for example they filed the charge sheet after two years and uh, uh, but the, the entire charge sheet was in Kannada in the local language only so I applied for a translated a certified translated copy of the charge sheet they again take another uh, two to three years for giving me all those documents so that's how it went on and on. Then I filed a discharge petition, uh, which was dismissed by the Sessions Court. I went to the High Court. High Court also dismissed my discharge petition. Then finally, the Supreme Court also uh, dismissed the discharge petition, asking me to go and uh, face the trial. So now the present situation is that uh, in 2000, uh, I, I think it was in 2017 or 18, there was a judgment by the Supreme Court that all the UAPA cases have to be tried only under uh, uh, NIA courts. Then I filed a petition in the Sessions Court to get my case transferred to the NIA court. Uh, on that petition also, it took a lot of time and finally the argument is done. The hearing was over, but the Sessions Court is sitting on it. Uh, an order is yet to be passed on that petition. So once uh, uh, an order is passed, the, my case will be transferred to the NIA court and the trial will begin. So that's a situation. So what we have to understand, after 12 years, the trial is, uh, the, even the trial has not begun. Like I'm still waiting for the trial. So this is actually the punishment. This is the course of the punishment. And the case, the, the case that they have built up is actually very fragile. Like uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, when I went through that charge sheet, 
there is nothing much like i don't i i'm i'm confident that i will be able to fight and win the case in the court but still it it is taking time like anything so that is that is my situation and also as danya pointed out i learned law i did a course on law like i i took graduation llb and to i joined for the course in 2015 because when i i go to the court every time i find something very you know very embarrassing for me because my lawyer is talking to the judge and the judge is talking to my lawyer and the lawyers are talking to each other and i'm not i'm not able to get anything i don't understand that language at all it sounded greek to me so then i decided i should learn uh, i should i should understand what they are talking about they are talking about me that i know so then i went uh, for the course then uh, in my experience i understood that learning law is actually an empowering tool uh, you will be able to understand not only what you are going through but you will be able to understand what all others are going through so uh, it's like yeah of course now we are talking in the context of this legal guide uh, which is very important at this point of time i think so uh, this is what i wanted to tell in the beginning like it is very important for every journalist to have an understanding about what they are going through when they are slapped uh, a case on them so this this kind of documents like this legal guide and having some kind of legal education is very important that's what i wanted to say danya thank you shahina but unfortunately or fortunately uh, for those who don't have cases they don't have to study the law and uh, a lot of people may not be able to even do that for journalists who cannot who cannot be going to the extent which shahina was forced to to study law to understand what is happening to them kunal how will the legal guide help uh, what is the legal guide put, what is the legal guide put together and how will it help journalists could you explain the legal guide to those listening in sure so the thing is that usually for those of of us who have gone to journalism school we used to have the subject called media laws and ethics and when you look at the syllabus of media laws and ethics you will always find the laws are prescribed very much from a very government perspective like what are your duties as a journalist what are the laws that you i mean of course these are in, important but in today's day and age there are other laws which are now being used to target journalists so you cannot any more just limit yourself to know knowing about basically article 191 restrictions uh you know the other things about parliamentary privileges etc etc you need to know many other laws including laws like security laws you know we we spoke to shaina and then we're going to speak to uh, tanveer warsi they are the journalists who have been targeted with with laws which otherwise are not meant to be used against journalists so what do you do in a situation like this for example uapa now at this point you know we have around at least 11 journalists according to cpg data who are either being investigated or being tried under uapa so now as shahina mentioned if you do not know the law and you are completely dependent on a lawyer what do you do in a situation like that so in collaborate in collaboration with thomson reuters uh, trust law we have developed this document which basically looks at the laws that are used against journalists which are not necessarily the simple article 191 and article 192 reasonable restrictions but these are laws which have been used in the last few years particularly after the pandemic uh, and we picked up these based on a, a document based on cpj documentation we actually gone through the laws that have been used and we have given easy steps on what do you do for example when you get a defamation suit what what are the step 1 step 2 step 3 what do you do when an fir is filed into you step 1 step 2 step 3 what do you do in a case for example online harassment now so far you know we do not know that there is actually i mean i was very surprised in fact when i read the document that there are at least four laws that you can use to protect yourself when you are online harassed so this document is a very easy uh, snackable for a lack of better word a document which allows you to get a at least a basic understanding of what your legal rights are of course this is not a replacement i must repeat uh, with big disclaimer and warning that this is not a replacement for a proper legal advice you should obviously hire a lawyer and get a proper legal advice but at least you know when your lawyers are talking to you what they are talking about and, and as journalists we are used to reading thick documents and you know crunching it down for our readers to understand so here is a document 
we have a shorter version which is around six pages and we have a longer version which is around 24 pages available both in english and hindi at this moment moment and we are in attempting to translate it to other indian languages so when you read it you know in at least four different four circumstances simple fir slap suits uh defamation uh, fir slap suits security laws and covid so what in these four different situations how do you react and how do you respond and what are your rights are so uh, for all the journalists listening in this uh, this legal guide made by cpj the trust law uh, uh, is actually very useful i'm just going to read out a small portion from it it says know your rights as a journalist in india the right to free speech is a fundamental right available to all citizens this includes freedom of press freedom of publication circulation and rights against free censorship this means that you can voice criticism of the government or the country however this freedom is not unlimited and your speech may be restricted if it disrupts public order incites the commission of an offence or threatens national security so i think everything has been put together in a succinct manner for someone who wants to quickly go through what are your legal rights what are what are the uh, you know definitions of of your rights and what is the limitations that you have plus what are the different kinds of laws which are used against journalists it's no longer just defamation laws civil and criminal but many different kinds of laws other than civil defamation and and sections of the ipc are being used against journalists to those listening in i also want to tell you if you have any questions please put that in the comment box i will uh, put across your questions to those uh, to the panelists tanvir ji main ab aapse puchna chahti hu pardon my uh, hindi but um, आपके साथ क्या हुआ था कोविड के समय और इस एक्सपीरियंस के बाद आप हमें बोल रहे हमें बता रहे थे कि आप भी अभी हेल्प करते हैं दूसरे जर्नलिस्ट जर्नलिस्ट यू आल्सो हेल्प अदर जर्नलिस्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट इज गोइंग ऑन तो आप जो लोग सुन रहे हैं उनके लिए ये बता दीजिए कि आपके साथ क्या हुआ था मैं लगभग इक्कीस से बाईस वर्ष पहले से मध्य प्रदेश में पत्रकारिता कर रहा हूँ मेरी शुरुआत इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया से हुई थी जब हर समय के रीजनल चैनल उसके बाद फिलहाल मैं तीन रीजनल चैनल ए एन आई एन डी टी और पंजाब केसरी के लिए काम कर रहा था और अपना एक खुद का पेपर था जो प्रभात संकेत में पब्लिश कर रहा था कोविड के समय जो मध्य प्रदेश में जो हालात थे वो जिस तरह से मरीजों को परेशानी हो रही थी ऑक्सीजन मिल नहीं रही थी और गलत तरह का फीडबैक प्रशासन द्वारा दिया जा रहा था यहाँ तक कि मीडिया भी उनके सपोर्ट में उन्होंने उसको ले लिया था तो भ्रामक खबरें प्रकाशित की जा रही थी लेकिन मरीजों की जो कोविड से पीड़ित थे उनके हालात हमसे देखे नहीं जा रहे थे और उन भ्रामक खबरों का हमने समर्थन नहीं किया था जिस तरह से आ, हमारे एक छोटे से जिला है राजगढ़ वहाँ पर वेंटिलेटर्स बंद पड़े हुए थे और खबरें प्रकाशित प्रकाशन द्वारा कराई जा रही थी कि वेंटिलेटर्स चालू हैं और अच्छी मरीजों को सुविधाएं दी जा रही हैं जबकि वो इंस्टॉल ही नहीं किए गए थे कंपनी द्वारा तो उनसे कोई मरीज को सुविधा नहीं मिली ये बाद में आर में उन्होंने जानकारी दी हमको भी हमने यही खबर प्रकाशित की थी कि जिन मशीनों को इंस्टॉल ही नहीं किया गया है उनसे सुविधाएं कोविड पीड़ित कैसे ले लेगा क्योंकि दूर दूर से लोग ऐसी खबरें देख करके अपने मरीज को लेकर वहां पहुंच रहे थे कि भाई वेंटिलेटर से डिस्ट्रिक्ट हेडक्वार्टर में चालू है तो जिला मुख्यालय पे इसको सुविधा मिल जाएगी उपचार की तो वो हमारी खबरों से के प्रकाशन से हमने जो सत्यता थी हमने इसलिए दी थी कि लोग यहाँ भ्रामक खबरों से ना पहुंचे और ऑक्सीजन मिल नहीं रही थी एक आई जो वार्ड था और उस पहली ही बारिश में उसकी जो छत से पानी टपकना शुरू हुआ तो पूरे कोविड मरीजों को काफी परेशानी झेलना पड़ी बाकी समाचार पत्रों में अधिकांश में खबरें प्रशासन द्वारा दो दबाव या किसी भी तरह से रुकवा दी गई थी पर हमने उन खबरों को नहीं रोका हमने उसको दिखाया जिसका परिणाम ये रहा कि हम उस पर लगातार पुलिस प्रकरण दर्ज किए गए एक प्राइवेट निजी हॉस्पिटल था मेरे दूर के परिचितों में उसका मालिक मुझे पता करके मुझ पर एफ दर्ज की गई फिर उसके बाद मेरा समाचार पत्र जो होता था जो आर एन अप्रूव था उसको मुझे गलत तरीके से प्रकाशित करने की एक धारा लगाई गई फिर उसके बाद मेरी जो जमीन पंद्रह बीस साल पुरानी मुझे खरीदी थी मुझ पर ये एफ की गई कि आपके पास इसकी रजिस्ट्री नहीं है कुल मिलाकर के जैसे जैसे प्रमाण उनके पास आते गए तो लगा ये बच रहा है तो तीन एफ आई दर्ज की तीनों में मेरी कोई शिकायत करता नहीं आया कलेक्टर की जांच के बाद एस डी एम मोहदाई द्वारा ये एफ की गई फरियादी प्रशासन है और आरोपी हम थे उसमें लगभग दो दर्जन से अधिक धाराओं में हमने मामला दर्ज किया 12 घंटे के अंदर हमको फरार घोषित करके हमारी मध्य प्रदेश शासन से जो पत्रकारिता की अधिमानत थी उसको निरस्त करा दिया गया मेरे तमाम मिलने वाले मित्रों के और परिजनों के प्रतिष्ठान जो व्यवसायिक थे उनको सील करा दिया गया और मुझ पर इनाम घोषित कर दिया गया बारह घंटे के अंदर मुझको एक 
आतंकी की तरह मतलब पुलिस ने और प्रशासन ने प्रचारित किया और मेरे परिजनों को काफी प्रताड़ित किया काफी तरह की परेशानी हमने झेली है एक तरफ मेरी वाइफ जो खुद डॉक्टर है और गवर्नमेंट डॉक्टर है भोपाल राजधानी में वो कोरोना योद्धा के रूप में सेवाएं दे रही थी मेरी बेटी डॉक्टर है वो सेवाएं दे रही थी और यहाँ मेरे साथ जो है इस तरह का बर्ताव पुलिस और प्रशासन द्वारा किया जा रहा था केवल इसलिए कि सच जो देह उसको दिखाने के लिए हमको सजा दी जा रही थी तो लगभग साढ़े पाँच महीने मुझको फिर जेल में बिताना पड़े और कोई संस्था कोई साथी कोई यहाँ पे ऐसा कोई मददगार कोई संस्था भी नहीं है आज तो बड़ा अच्छा है कि आपने हम लोगों को इसलिए कम से कम सुन रहे हैं आप मौका दे रहे हैं यहाँ मध्य प्रदेश में कोई ऐसा मंच नहीं है जो किसी पीड़ित पड़ित पत्रकार यदि कोई है उसकी कलम को रोका जा रहा है तो उसके साथ खड़ा होता है इस सच का साथ देने में लोग इसलिए दूर हो जाते हैं कि उनको भी परेशान किया जाए अब तो बुलडोजर की राजनीति हमारे प्रदेश में चल गई तो इस तरह से मतलब सच ना दिखाने के लिए कई इनाम मिल जाएंगे पर सच दिखाने के लिए तो वही होगा जो हमारे साथ में तो हमने भुगता है उसको तो सीपीजे एक एक कुरान जी से हमारी कभी मुलाकात होती है एक मात्र सीपीजे वो संस्था थी जिसने मेरे परिवार से संपर्क किया था हमारी मदद की हमको गाइड किया अब मैंने तीनों अपने जो मामले हैं हाईकोर्ट में लगाए हैं फोर एटी टू में ताकि एफ आई आर में बेच कर सकूँ मेरे पास काफ़ी एविडेंस उसके हैं क्योंकि इन तीनों चीज़ों से हमारा कोई लेना देना नहीं था जो आरोप हम पे लगाए लेकिन उन्हें उस समय हमें रोकना था तो वो सफल हुए इसमें so for those uh, who cannot uh, follow hindi like uh, me uh, what mr tanvi was saying is that during covid 19 uh, there were multiple cases filed against him uh, criminal cases fir filed against him for nothing to do with his work but random cases for example one of his relatives owned a hospital there was some case filed against him based on that this all for his reporting on how the madhya pradesh government was managing the pandemic really badly uh tanvi is not the only person i think around 5 to 6 journalists in madhya pradesh faced cases during this time the madhya pradesh government went after them tanvi was arrested in fact uh, they had pr- uh, pr- proclaimed a prize a reward in his name for almost 12 hours as if he was a terrorist that is what he says as if i was a terrorist they de- uh, they declared an, a reward for me right kunal that's what he was saying and he was jailed for almost 5 and a half months imagine a journalist doing his job reporting on how the pandemic is being mismanaged was sent to jail in unrelated cases that is how a government can bo- go behind you if they wish to they need not target your work they can target you in many different ways uh, i want to now go to joinita joinita you you were part of putting this guide together right what has uh, what is it that you would want to tell us about what are the kind of laws which are being used increasingly against journalists it's no longer just uh, defamation and sections of the ipc right that's absolutely right tanya um unfortunately it's no longer just the indian penal code or the ipc as uh, we know it because the most common at least uh, you know when uh, we were studying law and uh, studying journalism the most common uh, case journalists faced was either um, defamation or slander or libel um and uh, now i mean um, i i i i don't think it's a it's a good thing at all but unfortunately the the world has evolved to such a level that we have uh, specific sections of different laws um that are being used to target journalists um this is one of the things that has actually been covered in the guide um, you know to kind of break that myth that it's only specific um sections of the ipc or or you know specific as- aspects of the constitution under Uh, article 192 you know which come within reasonable restrictions that allow you to um you know uh, suppress any kind of freedom of expression in fact um at present we have cases of uh, under the contempt of courts act uh, there are cases under the disaster management act Uh, which is probably what was used um you know on uh, tanvir ji um even the epidemic diseases act uh, which was used in fact during covid quite a bit on journalists uh, information technology act uh, especially because of the use of different platforms through which we are communicating these days um so sections from uh, the information technology act can also be used as well as the uapa or the unlawful activities prevention act um in fact I, actually uh, quite recently um there was uh, and and those of you who uh, have been following it would be familiar with the uh, shreya singhal case um where you know uh, the supreme court has repealed section 66a of the information technology act saying that it was too wide a definition and too ambiguous 
um, you know, because it, it had uh, the, the section contained portions that said, you know, any person causing annoyance, irritation or nuisance. Um, things that uh, could not actually be def defined right and and that was what was used in 2012 uh, to uh, you know arrest two youngsters who had been speaking uh, against uh, an incident that took place in mumbai uh, after the death of uh, shiv sena leader bal thakre um, and and you know the case was lodged in 2015 this uh, PI, uh, PIL was lodged of course in the Supreme Court in 2015 up till now it has been kind of debated on various aspects um, but finally the Supreme Court has come to a decision and said you know uh, section 66a of the Information Technology Act is completely repealed uh, section 69 um, B has uh, been you know uh, read down and those kind of things so um, it, all to say that, you know, uh, because our country has so many laws, um, you just don't know when, which aspect or which section of a law could be used um, under what definition. And that, that was one of the reasons why when CPJ approached trust law to, um, you know, develop this guide, it was something that we were very keen to do because Thomson Reuters Foundation, of course, looks at fostering um, a good and responsible media. We look at supporting, uh, you know, in, in inclusive economies and promoting human rights and uh, working for the rights of journalists come well within our, our scope of work. Um, and so we worked with a law firm uh, in India, Shardul Amarchan, Mangaldas and Co to develop this guide. Um, as Kunal mentioned, the guide is a 24 page long document, which has more details in it. Um, but then for quick and easy access, we have the six page overview which um, you can refer to and get quick, um, you know, a quick understanding on things. Thank you, Joinita. So yes, the guide uh, is 24 pages. I recommend that all journalists try to get hold of the guide. I'm sure CPJ has it on its website, uh, Kunal. Yes. So it's downloadable. It's very easy. And it is it, it makes for essential reading. Shaina, if I can come back to you, uh, something which Mr. Tanvi said uh, while he was speaking struck me. He said that, uh, you know, I'm glad that I am in this uh, uh, in this panel now speaking about this, but there is not a lot of support for us in Madhya Pradesh. Now, is that a problem which a lot of journalists face, especially journalists who are working in regional publications, that when they face cases or, uh, you know, the might of the state or the might of the union government, that literally there is no one to speak for them, even amongst their own uh, journalist, uh, journalist circles? Shine on mute on uh, Okay, Danya, before coming to that point, I actually uh, wanted to point out uh, one more thing. Uh, I mean, like uh, having uh, some knowledge about what all sections or what all statutes that uh, that are used for booking a journalist i think it is it is also equally important to know the procedure too i, I i'm telling this from my own experience my case was uh, when my case started it was like any other case i mean like the criminal procedure was very uh, a normal one and uh, the fir was filed and uh, filed in the i mean like the fir was filed in the magistrate court only after two years, only after two years of this case, I understood that the magistrate court doesn't have the jurisdiction to take cognizance in a UAPA case. Even my lawyer who was handling this case was not aware of it. This is actually very unfortunate. Like, you know, I mean, of course, the, the situation might have changed now because it was the beginning of su uh, such a trend like booking journalists and a UAPA. So I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not blaming uh, my lawyer, nothing like that. But maybe he also might not have that much experience in handling UAPA cases. But anyway, I lost two years. Uh, otherwise, I had this option to uh, challenge it in the beginning, like because uh, the, I, I had the option to challenge the entire procedure i had the option to challenge uh, uh, the entire case uh, or for this reason that the entire procedure was wrong so i lost all those options so what i am trying to tell is that uh, journalists uh, unfortunately journalists have to 
uh, take an initiative to understand the procedures or, or procedure or under different sections of IPC or under different statutes. And also, uh, once when we get back to Tanvir, I also Tanvir Ji, I wanted to ask him one thing: uh, uh, which are the kind of uh, statutes under which he was booked? Whether there was some kind of health emergency act was uh, in existence during that time, or was it like you know kind of a disaster management act? Whether there, there were some special statutes whether he was booked under special statutes or some common law uh, so this is something which i wanted to know from tanvirji and coming to the your question danya this is of course very important having support from uh, journalist fraternity and from uh, civil society it is very important it, it, uh, uh, in my case i had lot of support from people in Kerala and outside Kerala and even at the international level, I got a lot of support from uh, like organizations like CPJ. I should mention CPJ because CPJ is an organization that stood by me from the very, very beginning of my case. But I think I got all those privileges only because uh, for one reason that I was working in English. I'm an English journalist. I was writing in English. I'm speaking in English. And so many people know me. So that is one reason. There are a lot of, lot of journalists working, working in local languages, in regional languages who are not receiving any support at all. So this is actually very important. I think uh, we have to think about building up networks and building up a system to extend support to journalists working in local languages uh, to uh, provide legal support, uh, le uh, something like establishing a legal cell to provide uh, legal assistance and legal advice to people in different languages. So uh, I think this is very important. Uh, having support is very important. So since this event is also organized by DigiPub, I just want to say we do have a legal cell because we have around 100 digital media organizations with us. We have a legal cell and we are trying to give pro bono a uh, legal help to journalists in uh, in DigiPub who may be facing cases. Kunal, I think you want to say something, uh, but I also want to add here something from both what Tanmir and Shahina was saying. Uh, during CPJ's work, have you also realized that sometimes journalists are just left in the lurch, that their organizations also don't help them beyond a point? Yeah. No, de definitely. So, you know, you, you also have to see the, uh, realize that CPJ is not a mammoth organization. Uh, just because uh, we are able to, uh, you know, reach out to few people, uh, we do not have the resources to reach out to everyone. Yeah, you know, we are an international organization. We work in all major countries around the world. You know, we do, we have a war going on in Ukraine. We have Afghanistan evacuation, and then you know, so we, one has to remember that. So obviously, we try to do our best. But I think what's important and what, uh, and I'm very happy, and uh, and one must commend DGPub. I mean, we didn't have an organization like DigiPub until a few years ago. And now we have DigiPub, which is doing an amazing work. I'm a, myself a member, so I'm uh, very uh, grateful uh, for the work and initiative that um, you know, people like Danya, uh, uh, Avinandan and others have undertaken. So it's commendable. And that's what is required. I think what, what's required is at, at, at the ground level within the country to build those resources. And uh, whether that's trust law or whether that's CPJ, we are only going to help support to build it up wherever we can. We, we cannot be the people at the forefront of it. And that's very important to remember. And China, you're absolutely right. I mean, for example, uh, uh, you know, we happen to come across uh, Tanvir Warsi's case, but I mean, we just happen to come across the Warsi's case. We don't know. Uh, there are hundreds of Tanvir Warsi's around the country. Just this afternoon, I was talking to somebody from Bengal who said, in just in last two weeks, he had he had received copies of three FIRs uh, that has have taken place against journalists. Now I don't know uh, about about those cases. So it's important to build, uh, uh, you know, local uh, local organizations and empower them. And uh, obviously, we try to do our best. But I think a lot of initiatives have to be taken. Uh, from the people on the ground. So before I go to uh, Mr. Tanmir again, uh, something that Shahina was saying that journalists have to simply know the process, right? And the process itself is so uh, tiring. For example, uh, we have a criminal defamation case filed against us just now, two, three days ago. Uh, in the same, on the same story, we already have two civil defamation cases running in two different courts. There's a third case because the story involved more than one person. In the criminal defamation case, First, it's, people are located in different places. You have to sign vakalat. You have to notarize the vakalat. You have to ensure that you have a lawyer in place. 
you have to go make sure somebody goes during your summer so the simple things that we have to then take care of right so i think journalists have to be aware of all these things aur isi ke bare mein main aapko puchna chahti hu tanveer ji jab aapke khilaf itne sare uh, frs darj kiye gaye to uh, uh, you know ha- aapne kaise manage kiya kyunki bahut sare legal formalities bhi hai aapko court mein dar- ye darj karna hai wo darj karna hai police ke samne jana hai wo sab aapne kaise manage kiya मैम ये जो हुआ था ये एक मतलब चौंकाने वाली चीज़ थी क्योंकि बाईस साल के पत्रकारिता के करियर में ऐसा कभी हुआ ही नहीं कोई पुलिस में एक शिकायत तक हमारी दर्ज हुई थी और ये पहली बार ऐसा हुआ कि जब मामला दर्ज हुआ उसके लगभग तीन दिन पहले से हमारा फ़ोन ट्रेसिंग पे भी डाल दिया गया था मतलब ये पहले से प्रशासन को मालूम था कि इस पर एफ दर्ज करना इसी जिस तरह की जानकारी हमको मिल रही थी क्योंकि पुलिस से अमूमन पत्रकार का एक वास्ता हो जाता है तो हमको पहले से इनडायरेक्ट ये सचेत किया जा रहा था कि आप थोड़ा होशियार रहिए कुछ हो रहा है आप लगातार कोविड में जो मरीजों के लिए छाप रहे हैं इसका नुकसान आपको उठाना पड़ेगा पर उसको हम इसलिए नहीं समझ पाए कि इस तरह का तो कोई हमको अनुमान था नहीं लेकिन जब पहला मामला दर्ज होता है उसके बाद जब हम एंटीसीपेटिक के लिए जाते हैं तो उनको लगता है कि इनको बेल मिल जाएगी इस हॉस्पिटल का इनसे कोई लेना देना जिस हॉस्पिटल का मालिक इनको बताया जा रहा है तो उसके बाद हम पर आपत्ति लगाने के लिए एक और एफ दर्ज कर दी जाती थी इनका जो पेपर पब्लिश हो रहा था वो आर एन आई से अप्रूव नहीं था इन्होंने गलत तरीके से किसी से किराए पर वो पेपर लेकर के चलाया था इस तरह के आरोप प्रशासन ने हम पे लगाए खुद कलेक्टर की जांच है एस डी एम एफ करा रही जब जब हाईकोर्ट के सामने कोई एंटीसिपेटरी लेने जाता है और दूसरा केस वहाँ पर रख दिया जाता है तो फिर कोर्ट को भी बेल देने में थोड़ा सोचना पड़ता है जब लेकिन जब दूसरी बार हमने फिर उसके लिए बेल के लिए किया तो तीसरी एफ आई आर दर्ज कर दी गई क्योंकि हमारे पास एविडेंस तो पूरे थे लेकिन चूंकि एंटीसिपेटरी इन्होंने हमको मिलने नहीं दिया हमको पेश होना पड़ा और इस तरह की लगभग दो दर्जन धाराएं हम पे लगाई गई कि इसको किसी भी तरह से दो चार छह महीने के लिए जेल तो जाना ही है ये खुद हमारे अरेस्ट होने के बाद हमको खुद उन कुछ अधिकारियों ने पुलिस वालों ने बताया कि आपको ये केवल जेल भेजने के लिए सब किया जा रहा है हम समझ रहे हैं कि आप गलत हो रहा था मैं खुद उस समय कोविड से पीड़ित था रेमडेसिविर इंजेक्शन मुझको लग रहे थे जो हालात मैंने वहां देखे वही मैंने अपने पेपर में लिखे थे ऐसा कुछ नहीं था कि मेरे पास एविडेंस नहीं थे या कोई मैं घर पर या ऑफिस में बैठ करके कोई खबरें पब्लिश कर रहा था लेकिन चूंकि वो सच प्रशासन से इसलिए नहीं देखा गया कि मध्य प्रदेश जनसंपर्क से ही गलत खबरें पब्लिश कराई जा रही थी कि यहाँ पर कोविड की सुविधाएं पूरी तरह से दी जा रही हैं वेंटिलेटर्स वगैरह चालू हैं जनसंपर्क से खबरें जारी हो रही थी मैं इतना बड़ा झूठ जो है हम नहीं उसको बर्दाश्त कर सकते थे हमने सच्चाई दिखाई फिर उसके बाद जब परिवार को प्रताड़ित किया मेरे ब्रदर को मेरे भतीजे को बिठाया उन, उनके साथ प्रताड़ना पुलिस वाले द्वारा दी गई तो ये मैंने कभी देखा नहीं था और पुलिस पुलिस तो दूर कोई वकील भी ऐसे में सोचने में आते कि कौन साथ देगा पर जो कुणाल जी की तरफ से या सी जी की तरफ से जो गाइड लाइन दी जा रही थी परिजन को जिस हिसाब से जो हमने एंटीसिपेटरी ली उसके बाद हम आए फिर हमने फोर एटी टू में भी वहीं पे लगाया और मतलब कानूनी सलाहकार भी उस समय दूर हो जाते हैं जब सरकार और सत्ता आपके खिलाफ हो तो वो मेरे साथ हो रहा था मैं अकेला खड़ा था उस समय और कोई ना कोई पत्रकार संगठन हमारे साथ था मौजूद था ना कोई सामाजिक संस्थाएं भी दूर हो जाती है क्योंकि मध्य प्रदेश में भी जो सत्ता का जो जोर है वो पत्रकारों का काफी ज्यादा है आपको इससे बड़ी बात क्या होगी कि मुझे सीबीजे से जुड़ने के बाद जो मदद मिली उसका उसमें मेरी प्रताड़नाएं बाहर से प्रकाशित हुई बजाय इस प्रदेश की मुझे एक सवाल है मुझे एक सवाल है जब आपके आपके खिलाफ ये एफ दर्ज किए गए और आप जेल जा रहे थे तब शायद सभी को क्योंकि मैं तो बेंगलोर में बैठी हूँ शाहिना कुछी में बैठी है हमें शायद पता नहीं था कि ये हो रहा है आपके आपके इन योर व्यू पॉइंट हम कैसे ये खबर सबसे सबको पहुंचा सकते हैं क्योंकि हम कभी कभार जानते ही नहीं कि ये हो रहा है किसी के साथ क्योंकि मैंने आपके बारे में पहली बार पढ़ा था आर्टिकल फोर्टीन में आपके बारे में जो आर्टिकल छपा था वही मैंने वही मैंने आपके बाद आपके बारे में पढ़ा था तो आपके इन योर आपके नजरिए में सब लोग कैसे जान सकते हैं कि ये कुछ ऐसा कुछ हो रहा है कैसे जर्नलिस्ट ऑर्गेनाइज कर सकते हैं आप अपने आप को नहीं मैम इसके लिए सब अब तो खैर सोशल मीडिया मतलब काफी वो हो गया लेकिन हमने ये देखा है कि सोशल मीडिया पे भी जो खुद की अपनी वेबसाइट या जहाँ पे छोटी जगह पे जो शुरू करके चलाए हुए वो कहीं ना कहीं सत्ता के और प्रशासन के दबाव में ही काम करते हैं सबको विज्ञापन चाहिए अधिकतर जो है या फिर उनको किसी भी तरह से दबा या जो घटना मेरे साथ की गई वो मैं ये नहीं मानता हूँ ये बाकी लोगों को दबाने के लिए भी कर दी गई जब तनवीर के साथ ऐसा हो सकता है तो आप लोग भी होशियार रहे तो ये ये मतलब धन बल लेकर के जिस तरह से जो नुकसान पहुंचा सकते हैं 
वो हमको पहुंचाया गया हमारे वो आर्थिक नुकसान के साथ काफी बदनामी की गई वही खबरें जनसमर से या इनके द्वारा प्रकाशित कराई गई जिसमें हमको आरोपी सिद्ध कर दिया जाए ये बात अलग है कि कोर्ट में जवाब ना दे पाए वो लोग जिन्होंने हम एफ कराई है और हमको उसमें काफी सफलता भी मिली लेकिन जिस तरह से जब कोई पत्रकार निशाने पर आता है तो फिर उसको अकेला इसीलिए छोड़ जाता है कि उसके साथ जो कुछ किया जा सकता है कानून का जितना दुरुपयोग किया जा सकता है वो किया जाता है किया जाता है और छोटी जगहों पर तो ये काफी ज्यादा ये आवाज है हम तक नामुमकिन होती कि अगर ये सीपीजे कुणाल जी हमसे परिवार से संपर्क में ना आते तो हम भी यहाँ तक पहुंचो ये आवाज दब के रह जाती कुणाल जी आई ऑल्सो वॉन्ट टू पॉइंट आउट एक चीज क्या इनफैक्ट uh, मुझे भी इनके केस के बारे में कैसे पता चला मेरे को इनके केस के पता चला बिकॉज न्यूज क्लिक में सिर्फ एक आर्टिकल था उनके ऊपर मैं भी मैं भी हिंदी भाषी नहीं हूँ तो मैं भी हिंदी अखबार पढ़ता नहीं हूँ तो मेरे को न्यूज क्लिक में कासिफ काफी ने एक स्टोरी की थी आपके ऊपर और मैंने उस समय आई थिंक जो धनिया जी भी बता रही थी कि तीन अराउंड फाइव जर्नलिस्ट के अगेंस्ट में केसेस हुए थे मध्य प्रदेश में अराउंड कोविड टाइम एंड कासिफ ने वो स्टोरीज की थी तो मैंने न्यूज क्लिक से फिर स्टोरी उठाई एंड फिर देन आई रीच आउट एंड देन कासिफ हेल्प मी टू गेट इन टच विद मिस्टर वॉर्स इज वाइफ सो सो दैट्स हाउ आई केम टू नो अबाउट इट सो टू आंसर योर क्वेश्चन धनिया देर हैज टू बी अ मैकेनिज्म एक मैकेनिज्म चाहिए कि जब ये केसेस हो रहे हैं इसको कैसे एम्पलीफाई करें बिकॉज जैसे मैंने कहा कि आपका केस अगर कासिफ ने न्यूज क्लिक में नहीं छापा होता तो हो सकता है कि मैंने नहीं पिकअप किया मैंने पिकअप किया फिर पांच लोगों ने फिर बाद में आर्टिकल 19, आर्टिकल 19, तो बहुत रिसेंटली छपा है तो ऐसे ये इंपॉर्टेंट है Uh, to access assistance if they need especially legal assistance that is right um thanks danya so basically what um trust law has done and this is not just trust law but thomson reuters foundation has partnered with cpj and media defense to develop a system called the legal network for journalists at risks um and this this works globally um but um unfortunately it's not like a hotline system where you can call and 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 you know put a complaint through for now it it accepts requests only through email and so um i, I mean i can share the email address here it's help at medialegalhelp.org um any person who's facing some kind of threat some kind of uh, you know um arrest or any kind of uh, legal action uh, you know especially if they are journalists can write into this and between uh, cpj media defense and thomson reuters foundation we mobilize resources that are locally available to that person uh, to that journalist um, the only thing is it is over email um and the other way to do it like it is also from what i've heard you know digipub is doing an excellent job so that's that's definitely like more relatable in the indian context um and 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 easy to access um but but there are like that there, there is another tool it's not so much of legal help but it's also more like a filter a prevention tool that's the trf filter that uh, journalists can use on social media platforms at as of now it's currently only available in english um but it prevents uh, cyber uh, you know stalking pre- prevents any kind of cyber offense against journalists uh, especially focused on you know issues like doxing uh, sexual offenses that that are committed online and that kind of thing um and and so you can download the filter and use it now um, th- i know these are s- slow and sh- uh, far between in terms of uh, you know the the day to day issue but i do think that this is one of the spaces especially when we have organizations like cpj we have digipub um we have so many others that are are looking to support and and promote media freedom it does come to a space where i think the next step for us is to actually talk about how we can set up these kind of helpline services um you know th- there is childline everyone knows about childline 1098 um as something when when a child goes missing or a child is in need of care and protection i think we are coming to that age in this country unfortunately where we need a helpline service like that for journalists as well just so that these um you know these issues are brought to light and the people who are most or best equipped to handle them can actually reach out and and support so um for now i have the help, uh, uh, the legal network for journalists at risk to offer um it's help at media legal help.org 
Um, but hopefully soon we'll, we'll move and progress to better um, and quicker resources as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Joanita, in fact, it'd be helpful, Kunal, if all this is put in one place and we can share with journalists uh, also that what are the tools that they can uh, have, what is there at their disposal already, which people may not be aware of. Before I go to Shahinat, for all the journalists who are listening in or who will listen it at some point of time to the recorded version, uh, knowing your legal rights is one thing, but before you put out a story which could be challenged legally, one thing is not to bear every uh, every arrow uh, which you possess, right? Uh, in the sense, keep some of it to yourself. Don't put out everything in a story. Sometimes when you get a legal notice, you can always write back saying, I have more proof with me. What do you have to say? In fact, that has helped me twice recently. Uh, I got a notice from a company which has connects with the union government. Uh, they had a problem with the story and they said, you have to pull it down. So we had only included three people's versions in the story. We had around 15 with us. So we wrote back saying, here are the rest of the 12. What do you have to say? Um, so sometimes these kind of tricks uh, also do help, not just uh, knowing your legal right. Yeah. Uh, to coming to Shahina, Shahina, what about organizational help? Do you think that uh, one big problem which a lot of journalists face is that initially maybe the organization may help uh, and uh, later it may not? And what about freelance journalists? How difficult is it for them? Uh uh i think it's indeed very difficult for freelance journalists uh, we have recently seen it uh, with the case of siddhi kapan but even for journalists who are working in organizations it, i think it, that also is very difficult and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that the kind of support that i received from tehelka was very very poor like uh, Kunal once worked in Tehelka. Kunal knows about that organization. There are a lot of Tehelka journalists who faced cases. I, I, I don't know the same is the case with everyone, but at least I know a lot of people really, really suffered and the kind of organizational support was very little. Uh, I, I came across a lot of journalists complaining the same thing, like, you know, and they are not in a position even to talk about it in public. Uh, when if they talk about it, I mean, I'm at least privileged now to say that I got very little support only like I think that also is something it's it's kind of a privilege that we can talk about it. There are a lot of journalists who are not even in a position to say it in public so, because these organizations are very powerful and it would have a very negative impact upon their uh, professional growth and all so uh, and uh, when we talk about uh, freelance journalists it is very pathetic uh, there is no support system as i uh, said earlier uh, how much support a journalist gets completely depend upon his conduct or her conduct a network and all it's not a system like as uh Jonita rightly pointed out it's not like this child helpline nothing like that it's not a system but the person it varies from person to person uh, we, uh Siddhi Kapan spent two years in jail and uh only after Siddhi Kapan went to jail her uh, her family his family members like his wife uh, came up in public and she 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 has become a fighter so but it happened only after he went to the jail. So this is the case with most of the people. Uh, they have to spend at least one year or two years in jail. Or uh, I mean, they get the support very, very slowly. Uh, this is the, the this is especially very uh, this is applicable to this uh, freelancers and even freelancers even do not have they do not have identity cards like you know when a freelancer go to a place the problem begins from that stage itself when they go to a place for reporting they do not have an identity card a proper identity card nothing like that so i think we have to build up a system supporting freelancers uh, from uh, this very uh, initial stage of providing them some kind of uh, identity cards, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, recognition to their work for, uh, in the very process of reporting, not only after the report is published or carried in some media, uh, from the very big uh, beginning of the process, uh, there should be a mechanism to recognize their work. So I think that all will help in bringing up you know, uh, support for freelancers too. Jonita, if I can come to you, since you are the lawyer in the panel, one thing that we did not touch upon are uh, stay orders. 
uh, or injunctions, which is very, very common now that, in fact, two days ago, there was an injunction order taken by a, a BJP MLA in Karnataka against 46 media organizations saying they cannot do any defamatory reporting. Now, the injunctions that this guy has was uh, his son was caught taking a bribe and around six crores uh, was seized from his house. And he said that four to five crores anyway lie around in every farmer's house. Uh, OK, that must be some really rich farmer. But the point is the stay order in this case is no defamatory post can be written about him. Therefore, as a journalist, can I go ahead and write about the FIR and the uh, and the facts around the case? How how do you circumvent uh, stay orders? Shouldn't you, I think journalists have to be educated specifically on stay orders? I think journalists need to be educated on so many specific things now, right? From search and seizure to stay orders to you know uh, like. What do you do as soon as someone comes to arrest you? Um, but but answering more specifically, um, ju just to clarify, um, you said the the journalist received the stay order um, yes. on reporting further yes. on on the issue that the organizations have been given have been uh, served injunction orders saying they cannot do defamatory reporting. So, so in that itself lies the answer, right? Um, defamatory reporting, defamation, the definition according to law is if it is false, right? If the journalist has adequate evidence on what he is speaking, and of course, now this becomes a very tricky situation, right? As you said, you can't put out all your cards at the start itself, and then, uh, you know, you're you, you face even worse uh, repercussions. But what he can, he or she, uh, the journalist can challenge is on the basis on which they are claiming defamatory grounds to bring the injunction or the stay order. Because defamation has very clear evidence that is required, right? There has to be a false proclamation when it comes to defamation. So there can be, uh, so so the, the statement has to be completely untrue. Um, and that's the whole point on defamation. So actually, the journalist should then switch burden of proof onto the person who has um, asked for the injunction to say what in what I am stating is false. Um, and I know it's easier said than done, uh, you know, because uh, it's it's easy for me to argue over here and, and make these comments. But But the immediate step would be, of course, get a lawyer, get a lawyer to challenge the injunction based on and of course don't put out all the evidence there but but ask for burden of proof to be shifted onto the person who is making the statement hmm. so shift the burden of proof that's what you're saying kunal if i can uh, come to you next since cpj deals with a lot of cases for example what happened to mohammed zubair of alt news right Mo zubair gets arrested and on one fir if he gets bailed there's another fir waiting for him where he's re-arrested so uh, have there been other cases like this? I remember there was one in Telangana with Teenmar Malana, but is that also something with the journalists are facing, which is multiple cases and one after the arrest? Comes? Yes, yes, yes. Unfortunately, this has become becoming a trend. Uh, Zubair's case, Paha Shah's case is uh, it's uh, another one. It's almost merry go round. He was getting bail in one. He was being slapped in another, and I think it was almost four to five cases. Uh, even in Rupesh Kumar Singh, who's currently in prison in uh, Bihar, in Jharkhand, has had already had three cases. Now there's a fourth case. Uh, he's got bail in uh, three, and he's wait, awaiting the fresh case, which was filed into him in December. Uh, so this is unfortunately becoming a trend. And I, I mean, quite honestly, it's not just with journalists. I mean, we saw this uh, with. Uh, this uh, law, I forget the name of the lawmaker, the independent lawmaker from Gujarat, was dragged all the way to uh, Assam. And uh, he got bail in one charges, and then there was another, and the, the judge actually, uh, you know, called it out. I mean, called out the, the the executive for, you know, basically targeting him. So unfortunately, this is becoming a case, uh, and uh, and this is something that we've also seen. By the way, in Bengal, I, I remember during pandemic there was a, a in in a place near uh, Hubli, just not in it's near Calcutta, but not in Calcutta, uh, a place called Arambag, where a journalist uh, was basically. Uh, picked up. I mean, they tried all the methods, and he got anticipatory, much like what Tanviji was trying. And then they slapped him finally for cutting a tree, uh, and uh, then slapped him with some 12, 12 counts. So you know there is that. So it's it's like we'll go after you. I mean, we'll throw everything that we have at you, and then you can spend your time trying to 
prove yourself, uh, you know, uh, that you're innocent. And then I just wanted to add one thing. And because we were talking with Shaheen about freelancers, I think one thing which we are, I mean, you, you all are much senior to me, but I've also been around for now almost 16 years in journalism and I've been with such been colleagues with Shaheen at Talca. Uh, there is a severe lack of conversations, conversation around journalist safety in our newsrooms. Uh, and this is def different aspects of safety. There is legal safety, there is physical safety, there's the issue of life insurance, for example, you know. Uh, again, you know, Shaina would remember one of our former colleagues went to Chhattisgarh, two of our former colleagues, one of them died, passed away. Uh, after he, yeah. because he, yeah. he, he, he got uh, Tarun Sherawat, yeah, he, 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 yeah he, he was infected, uh, I think with malaria and number of yeah. diseases, you know, he went to an area and, and, you know, there was, and, so, so there, there is where there is. We need to have that conversation because in most standard newsrooms globally, there is a team which they, there is a conversation around safety. You just don't send people out there to report until unless there uh, there is a safety analysis whether that person is prepared to cover that particular topic. If you're working with Reuters, for example, if you work with BBC, you will not be sent to cover a riot until unless you have preparation for. You know, being, you know, I mean, I mean, we have seen during Delhi riots, for example, young women of Islamic faith without any training being sent to cover a riot where Muslims were being targeted. I mean, that's just common sense. But unfortunately, our editors and our proprietors have not woken up to this fact. And we need to have that conversation because while it's very easy to pre accuse the government and gov government and authorities are to be blamed, but there can be a lot of precautionary steps that we ourselves as journalists and newsrooms can Im, you know, imbibe. And a lot of it doesn't really, really need a lot of cost. It's just simple procedures. If those can be put in place, I think a lot of this will really help us. Tanvir ji, what do you think about it? Kunal is saying that newsrooms don't take seriously safety of their journalists. Legal safety, physical safety, mental health safety. ये सब कुछ इजीली लेते हैं सीरियसली नहीं लेते उसके उसके लिए कुछ कोई सीरियस काम नहीं करते न्यूज़ रूम्स और एडिटर्स जी बिल्कुल कुणाल जी मैं सहमत हूं इस बात से क्योंकि अनुमान यही देखा गया है कि जब जब आ, कोई ऐसी घटना होती है या कोई आरोप किसी पर लगाए जाते हैं तो भी वो सच के लिए वो काम कर रहा है मतलब उसके साथ में कोई आ, उनकी संस्था खड़ी नहीं होती वो कोई मदद के लिए तैयार नहीं होते आज कुणाल जी उनसे मुलाकात ही नहीं होती इस तरह से जैसे मुझे भी आपने पहले ही पूछा था कि मेरी जानकारी आप तक कहां तक कैसे पहुंची तो उसके लिए मेरे संस्थानों की और इनकी कोई मदद नहीं थी मुझे खुद ही अपना एक वीडियो वायरल इसलिए करना पड़ा था कि मेरे परिजनों को परेशान किया जा रहा था तो मैंने अपना जिस समय एंटीसिपेटरीली हमने लगाया हुआ था तो वीडियो वायरल किया था ठीक उसी तरह से अपने संस्थानों के लिए जिन लोगों से आपके करीबी संबंध है वो मदद कर देंगे लेकिन वो भी सामने आकर के खुलकर साथ नहीं देते तो ऐसा नहीं है कि सभी लोग बिल्कुल साथ हैं लेकिन मैं नाम मानता हूं कि वो आपको मदद मिलती है जो लोग पर्दे के पीछे से आपकी मदद करना चाहते हैं या वो अपने सोर्स से कैसे भी पर खुलकर आपकी मदद के लिए सामने ना कोई संस्थान आती है ना कोई ऐसी यहां प्लानिंग है या कुछ भी ऐसी जानकारी तभी आती है जब कोई घटना हो जाती है कोई वीडियो वायरल करता है या कोई दूसरा उनके परिजनों की पीड़ा अब तक पहुंचाता है ना कोई ऐसा उन्होंने कोई यहां पे बनाया हुआ है जैसे माध्यम एक जनसंपर्क है या जो भी है पर जैसे जिस तरह की हेल्पलाइन आम लोगों के लिए सब गवर्नमेंट चलाती है अभी भी तो प्रेस के लिए कोई रूल नहीं है इस तरह की कोई मदद अगर मांगे तो कहां मांगे जूटी एफआईआर हुई एक हुई दो हुई तीन हुई लेकिन सुनने को तो कोई तैयार ही नहीं था तो ऐसा सभी के साथ लगभग होता है कि उसको अकेले ही इस लड़ाई से लड़ना पड़ता है शाइना व्हाट इज योर ओपिनियन आर न्यूज़ रूम्स नॉट टेकिंग सेफ्टी ऑफ द जर्नलिस्ट वेरी सीरियसली स्पेशली एज द environment we ourselves concede is becoming uh, worse and worse. Unmute. Unmute. Sorry, sorry. I think uh, the mainstream popular cinema has a role in that. The image of a journalist is somebody who does to go anywhere and you know. Uh, so actually I think, no, I mean, 
there is there is a complete lack of understanding about safety that is one thing and uh, as uh, kunal pointed out the newsrooms are not providing safety to journalists at all and for journalists the, for, the problem with journalists is that they they don't even know that asking for safety is their right we have a right to safety but people have people are so reluctant to discuss this kind of issues with their editors because they think that if okay if we talk to our editors like oh there is a safety issue in going there maybe the journalist who is in the field the reporter in the field only he must be knowing the real picture only he must be knowing that there is a risk in going there there is a safety issue in going there so the journalists should have this environment in the newsrooms they should have this openness to talk to their editors that there is a problem uh, uh, going there is risky and the, uh, i i mean the news the editors are uh, the editors have to be blamed for this because they also think that asking for safety is something very it's a luxury like you know journalists are supposed to go anywhere not at all journalists are not, not supposed to go anywhere journalists should think about safety first so i think there is a need to educate journalists uh, not only the reporters but editors too uh, to, uh, to to be concerned about safety first and to think and analyze the situation before jumping into you know a riot situation or wherever so i think there is a need to uh, uh, all the, not only the journalists but editors to have to be educated and, and i think uh, it's not only a problem of un, uh, the lack of understanding it is also a problem of a lack of responsibility like the newsrooms are not ready to take the responsibility the and editors are not ready to take well. yeah of course this, uh, yeah this romanticization of this the job of a journalist that is one thing and also i think the editors are not interested to take the responsibility and because it is sometimes expensive too providing safety is uh, expensive you, you may have to employ instead of one reporter or one or two reporters you may have to employ more people to one place and you know you have to so it it it, it, it involves some cost so all the most of the editors actually want to do things in this way they 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 think about safety only after something happened to a reporter what happened to our colleague in tehelka was very unfortunate as uh, uh, kunal pointed out he was so young he was just 22 he was a photographer he just started his profession and uh, it was like he went to a place even without having the basic medicines and things like that so it is it is actually a gross negligence from the part of the editor so i think editors have to be educated first because they they, they have to be they, some somebody should tell them this is the right of a journalist to have safety is the right of a journalist uh joinita since we are saying talking about right to safety because before we wrap up uh, i have a quick question again i i'll go back to zubair because today i'm just taking this as an example i was seeing that there are lots of th threats of violence and these are not made by uh, anonymous DPs on social media. But today there's been escalation of threats to Zubair particularly uh, and from really big handles. Uh, this can happen to anyone, uh, right? This can happen to any journalist working with any organization. At that time, other than, of course, filing a few cases against these people where you do not even know if the police are going to help you, what more can we do? That's actually a very good question, Dhanya. Um, so in terms of looking at the, the legal aspects, you, you stated it right. Uh, if it's through social media platforms or whatever, they have the right to actually go ahead and, um, you know, fi file under the Information Technology Act, file a complaint. Um, each uh, police station, not each police station, but each city or each district has to have now uh, uh, an information techno uh, information technology um, unit where you can reach out to like the superintendent of the police also in certain cases and uh, file a complaint and they have to take cognizance of it. So that's one um, recourse that is there. Um, beyond that, I, I think in, in the guide, we've kind of covered this in terms of like online harassment of uh, journalists, uh, where we have mentioned that uh, one of the first things to do is actually build collective will ar around, um, you know, the, the journalist or, or the individual at risk. Um, and, and building that kind of, uh, you know, public will has always helped 
in in most cases uh to kind of support the journalists i know it's not an ideal solution it's 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 even much harder to do sometimes um but it is I, I, we don't have any other additional kind of legal recourse available beyond filing a complaint and uh, you know kind of building a collective support to fight it or to bring awareness on it um so so those are the two main things i would say that a journalist has recourse to it it may not seem like the 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 silver bullet but it is one step towards it no i definitely think building collective will happens at least people know that someone is watching someone is responding that it is not going unnoticed right so um i i guess we have run out of time and without any uh, uh, i mean i think somehow the comments were blocked so we couldn't take questions uh, but that that's okay i think a lot of things were touched upon to all the journalists uh, who will be watching this do download the legal guide do give it to people working in your organization outside your organization etc it will be helpful and be cognizant of what the what are those tools which can which is accessible uh, which you should access uh, to understand how to keep yourself and someone around you safe so uh, wishing a uh, happy and safe journalism to all of us and uh, thank you very much kunal shaina joinita and tanmeer ji uh, for this conversation thank you very much thank you so much dhanya thank you to dg pa for organizing this thank you thank you thank you thank you everyone i will also send you the link and maybe